I just want to make a few remarks before we have a general discussion on the floor. We have the great privilege of having Professor Ingram Olsen here today and listening to him. However, I must say this thing that there is a reason why commercial journals have come up. <coughs> it is not, this is probably the first time, first uh, time where, where uh, at least where I have been, where this particular question of publication policy has been discussed. There may have, it may have been discussed in some other conferences or meetings, but not to my knowledge. But behind the scenes, in conferences, all over the world and the different meetings, a lot of discussion has taken place. Before each journal starts, a big revolution develops, a movement gets created. You see. Some, some people's blood is really burning, you see, in that. And that's how journals have started. Uh, <coughs> Journals start because there is insensitivity on the part of the editors of established journals right. to new fields which they do not understand. They don't want to. In the early 60s, the topologists thought that problems in combinatorial mathematics are really very simple. After all, you can solve them in finite time. So you can make two orthogonal Latin squares, well you can run your computer and you can eventually solve the problem. Of course now we know that it will take the best computer that we have more than 4 billion years to solve that problem on a computer without the aid of mathematics. So these thinkers you see, and there are counterparts of these thinkers in statistics also. People, you see, who are obsessed with continuous mathematics, who did not understand the importance of, of combinatorics. I am just giving an example. There are examples the other way also. And we find that in the last 20 years, there are several dozen combinatorial journals that have come up. And the pressure is still very great uh, in combinatorics. So I am just giving an example. You see. It's not that the combinatorial people also think wrongly about something else. So, but, but, but this is what causes the, the cropping up of new journals. Costs are certainly high with commercial uh, publications and I'm all in favor of trying to do something to reduce it. But, you see, society versus commercial journals. Well, you see, society has many sectors. There are intellectuals, you know, who do research, teach and so on. There are administrators, there are business people and so on. For business people and for dealing with that sector of society, it seems that the world is quite a bit in agreement that there should be free enterprise. <coughs> we have seen the fall of communism, right next door, in all these European countries and Soviet Union and so on. Do we want a totalitarianism in the field of intellectual <laughs> pursuits? Should professors, researchers, should they live under totalitarianism or not? That is a question that has to be thought of. See, if you create one monolith, one big society where you see the, you know, somebody who is president is the, is the you know, god of the society, he decides what he has to think, he decides what he must, he must work on and so on, I am sure that eventually we will have the same problems which we have faced in the field of, of business and so on and then in, 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 in economic life. See, in the field of economic life we have found that it is important to, to give some way to free enterprise. Similarly, you see, in the intellectual field, I submit to all of you that it will, be, it will remain very important that we give way to free enterprise in the, in, in the intellectual field. <coughs> so, 
so these things are, in, you know, have to be considered. But having said that, there is no doubt to say that uh, efforts should be made to cut down on the cost of publications. And uh, there is also another problem with societies. I find I get many journals from societies of which I am a member. I, I do not find them very interesting. The American statistician, you see, which I have to get because I am a member of the ASA, comes to me but I hardly ever read it. You see, it's the first thing that, is, that gets thrown see, in my office. You see, when I, whenever I am a member of this American Mathematical Society, so many of the math reviews get collected that there isn't space in the office to keep them. The societies decide that every member should get such and such thing. And sometimes you see those decisions are quite wrong. In many, many departments in the United States, you see, people have stopped reading the annals statistics. Sorry to say that. Even my journal, you see, there's a lot of complaint that they're getting too theoretical. So, so, so the thing is that I do not believe, I mean, while I agree with the spirit of what Ingram is saying and what everybody else said, costs should be brought down and so on. I do not believe that there is a simplistic solution to that, that, that problem. We have to, to look at this problem in a deeper way and, uh, and try to, um, to, to, to come up with solutions. You see, solutions will grow. It is, uh, in fact, they will grow as, as the society grows. You know, the different parts of the world will have different aspects of the same problem. So, so I think uh, it will have to be done that way rather than any one group of people making some decisions on how, you know, publication should be done in the world. Well, now uh, I would like to open the discussion floor if anybody wants to make any comments. Um, the Econometric Society actually offers special prices for um, Eastern Europeans. Is that, is that, is that correct? They uh, have uh, a rate for um, Polish uh, econometricians, for uh, Hungarian econometricians, and so on. And then every so often, whole Congress is in within the East, uh, Eastern Europe. So to spend all the accumulation in that way. Yeah, thank you. No. Let me tell you. I think that the proliferation of journals is really <coughs> one problem. There's just not enough space. You see, uh, I happen to have another large office, but it is so full. So I took a lot of journals to my home, and now my house is getting full, you see. So, <laughs> so uh, some solution has to be thought, you see, instead of printing the whole 
whole journal and paper, maybe we should just have it on disk and so on. The library of disks might be there. And I, maybe that will bring the cost down dramatically. I think there will be a solution to the problem of cost, but in a different way. Perhaps through disks and so on. Anybody else? The problem with disks actually is I've argued you won't let us use them. You, get it, you buy, a, uh, buy a book with a disk in the back of it and the library won't let uh, uh, users of the library use it because it, it's a specific disk for the person who bought the book and not for library users. This is, this is uh, uh, British law, so uh, presumably other countries will have different uh, systems. But, uh, no, what I meant was that freely available. That, uh, you see, a company could produce a journal on a, on a disk issue. Yeah. Or this corresponding to a big yeah. book. Now those disks you see could be distributed to libraries and so on. And as Professor Lau said, I think his point was very important. This review journal that he's talking about, let, let everybody have something like that. Then if I'm interested in this particular set of papers, then I call for those disks you see, that's all. And the price of those disks might be very small. So, you see, so the problem may be solved in that, that way. Yeah, this, the American Math Society does exactly that, except it's not on this. You can pay the American Math Society N dollars for so many papers from all the, from everything. And they will send you reprints of just those items. But if you think that's going to be cheap, you're wrong. <laughs> Nothing, the American AT&T, if you look at the cost of telephones, the same thing is going to happen. You're going to pay a lot more. That's what happened with the cost of meetings. The cost of meetings used to be very cheap. Now it's not at all unusual to pay $150 to go to a meeting. And uh, people just accept that. That's not, costs are just going to go up and you might as well face that. The other point that you did not, that needs to be mentioned, our mergers. Uh, we have no control over what happens to commercial publishers when they're taken over. Not too long ago, Academic Press was to be taken over by, uh, I've forgotten who, Murdoch or one of those, or Kentucky Fried Chicken, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know. So what happens when Kentucky Fried Chicken takes over uh, North Holland? Well, you don't know what happens. And that's, that's part of the problem. Uh, and we know that that's happened a lot. If anybody has published with Wiley, you will now know that a lot that they have released and will not republish a lot of the old books. I don't know if any of you have had that situation, but they're not republishing a lot of old books. And what happened was that Rydell and Krieger have reprinted many, and Dover have reprinted a number of those books. So you have to think about the future as well as the present. Well, yeah, I think that's a very important point. No doubt. Anybody else? Well, the session is closed. Thank you.